He wasn't here to produce miracles or to... Oops, sorry, I'm having problems getting myself settled here. <laughs> he wasn't here so much to do things for us on this planet as prepare for us the final event, which was his death and resurrection. That is why he was born. That is why he walked this earth. His primary focus wasn't on performing miracles. His primary focus wasn't on healing the sick. His primary focus wasn't on confronting the religious leaders. His primary focus when he came to earth, when he was born in that manger, was so that he could die on that cross and rise again. He lived a life that was sinless and perfect, and he is the only human being who ever has. And his purpose in being here was so that we could be restored to relationship with him. One of the things we're going to look at tonight I've entitled this, He is Alive. And you need to understand some things. I'm going to get a little graphic in some of what I discussed today. It is not so that I can be mean or rotten or, you know, focus on some gross stuff. But there's some important things that I want you to understand. Our text today actually comes from Matthew 28. And it says, Now after the Sabbath, near dawn on the first day of the week, Mary of Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the boulder back and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his garments as white as snow. And those keeping guard were so frightened at the sight of him that they were agitated and they trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be alarmed and frightened, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he said he would do. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they left the tomb hastily with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And as they went, behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail, greetings. And they went up to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be alarmed and afraid. Go and tell our brother, to our brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they are on their way, behold, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had occurred. And when the chief priest had gathered and the elders had consulted together, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldier and said, Tell people, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we were sleeping. And if the governor hears of it, we will appease him and make you safe and free from trouble and care. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been circulated among the Jews in the, to the present day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain of which Jesus had directed, and made appointment with, him, with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshipped him. But some still doubted. Jesus approached and, breaking the silence, said to them, All authority, all rule, power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go then and make disciples of all nations baptizing them into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. So let it be. This message I'm preaching today is actually adapted from a guy named Lee Stobel, and it's Jesus is Alive, True or False. If you had to guess, who would you say would be the greatest defense attorney in the world? F. Lee Bailey? Well, maybe he's fallen on hard times. Or Johnny Cochran? So let's check the author let's check an authoritative source on this. If we look in the Genesis Genesis Book of World Records, this is what it says. Most successful lawyer, Sir Lionel Luckhu, who succeeded in getting his two hundred and forty fifth successful murder charge acquittal by January 1st, 1985. It's an absolutely astonishing feat that nobody in the world has come close to replicating. Two hundred and forty-five murder trials in a row. Either one before a jury on an appeal. No wonder he's renowned as the real-life Perry Mason. What skills do you think he needed to rise to that unprecedented level of courtroom success? Certainly he must be smart and savvy. 
He must have tremendous analytical skills so he can dissect what may appear to be on the surface an airtight case. And he must be world-class expert on what constitutes reliable and persuasive evidence. All of that describes Lucku, who's been knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth and who has also served as a distinguished diplomat and a justice on his country's highest court. As we approach the resurrection, wouldn't it be interesting to get an opinion from an expert like Lucku on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, we're in luck, so to speak. During his own spiritual journey, Lucku turned his expertise to the question of whether the resurrection of Jesus Christ fits the test of a legal evidence, and here's the conclusion he ultimately reached. I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Amazing, isn't it? Our everyday experiences tells us that pigs don't talk, regardless of the movie, babe, that Santa Claus doesn't slide down chimneys, and the dead people don't spring back to life. And yet, here's the most successful attorney in the world applying the test of legal evidence to the case of Jesus Christ and concluding with absolute confidence that his resurrection is reality. And then Lakhu did the most logical thing he could do. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. We're going to get to the heart of Easter today. In fact, to get to the heart of Easter, the heart of Christianity itself, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and 19, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is mere delusion, futile and fruitless, and you are still in your sins, under the control and penalty of sin. And further, those who have died in spiritual fellowship and union with Christ have perished and are lost. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we, of all people, are most miserable and to be pitied. So the resurrection is the linchpin of Christianity and the ultimate authentication of Jesus' claim that he is God. I hope that those of you who are spiritual skeptics or seekers will do what Sir Lionel did. Keep an open mind and let the evidence lead you to where it points. I'm going to begin by summarizing how Jesus died, and I'm going to get a little graphic. There's an important reason for this. You see, some people take the position that Jesus never really died on the cross. In fact, that's what the Muslims teach. They call it the swoon theory, that Jesus fainted on the cross or took a drug that made him only appear to die, and then the cool air of the tomb revived him and he emerged alive. So they contend there was no resurrection because he hadn't really died. But as I describe to you what happened to Jesus, you'll quickly see the fallacy of that position. After Jesus' trial, in which he was found guilty of blasphemy for claiming to be God, John 19.1 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. A medical expert named Dr. C. Truman Davis studied what was involved and concluded that this was a brutal beating that left Jesus on the very verge of death. Jesus was tied to a post and beaten at least 39 times, and maybe more. Because the Romans didn't follow Jewish law. Jewish law required only that you couldn't beat them more than 40 times. And so they stopped at 39. But Romans didn't follow Jewish law. So they might have beat him more than 39. We're not sure. And we just know that he was flogged. And with a whip that was had jagged bones and balls of lead woven into it. Again and again. The whip was brought down with full force on his bare shoulders, back, and legs. At first the heavy thongs cut through his skin only. But as the blows continued, they cut deeper into his underlying tissues, first producing an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins, and finally the spurting of arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The balls of lead first produced large, deep bruises, which were then broken open by subsequent blows. By the end of the scourging, the skin of his back was left hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area was an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. One witness to a Roman flogging wrote this, The sufferer's veins were laid bare, and the very muscles and tendons and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. Undoubtedly, Jesus was in serious to critical condition even before the crucifixion began. It's no wonder, no wonder he was unable to carry his own cross. Then five to seven inch spikes were driven through his wrist, crushing the median nerve, which we call the funny bone. Experts say that this would be like squeezing your funny bone with a pair of pliers. So painful was death by crucifixion that they actually coined a new word to describe it. 
It's called excruciating, which is Latin for out of the cross. After his wrists and feet were nailed securely, he was hoisted in the air to hang. Death from crucifixion is basically a slow death by suffocation. Because of the stress of the muscles, Jesus could breathe in, but he couldn't breathe out unless he pushed himself up on his feet to relieve some of the pressure on his chest. Of course, what was tremendously painful because of his bloody back scraping against the coarse cross and because of the spikes through his feet. And after a while of pushing up again and again, exhaustion would set in. If the Romans wanted to hasten death, they used a mallet to shatter the victim's shin bones so he couldn't push up anymore. And the victim's lung were filled with carbon dioxide and he'd slowly asphyxiate. And that's what the executioners did to the criminals crucified on either side of Jesus. But when they came to him, they saw he was already dead. To confirm that, though, a soldier plunged a spear between his ribs, punctuating the sack around the heart and the and the heart itself, and causing clear fluid and blood to spew out, which eyewitnesses recorded. Then four Roman experts confirmed that he was dead. That is how crucifixion took place. Friends, nobody ever came down from a cross alive, and that included Jesus. An authoritative article in the prestigious journal The American Medical Society concluded, Clearly the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead, even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. In fact, think about this. Even if he wanted to go against everything he taught by intentionally deceiving people, even if he had somehow survived the cross, even if you were somehow to abide to escape from the cocoon of linen wrappings soaked with 75 pounds of spice, even if he could somehow roll away the huge boulder from the mouth of his tomb, a boulder so big that one ancient account said 20 men were required to budget, even if he could somehow get past an elite group of Roman guards, think of the condition he would have been in when he appeared to his disciples. He wouldn't have exactly inspired them with confidence and gotten them all excited about receiving that kind of resurrection body someday. He wouldn't have prompted them to triumphantly declare his glorious return and launch a worldwide movement. They would have been horrified and sickened by his bloody and broken condition. They would have pitied him and gotten him a doctor. So the evidence clearly refutes the swoon theory, which, by the way, people often bring up, but no reputable scholar believes in. So let's look at the affirmative evidence of the resurrection. I'm going to summarize it with three E's. The first E stands for early. The account of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection date back very early. For instance, a creed recited in the early church and preserved for us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 clearly affirms that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scripture. And then it cites specific people who Jesus appeared to. This creed is dated back to as nearly as early as two or three years after the crucifixion. This completely rebuts the idea that legends about the resurrection developed in the decades after Jesus' death. Studies have concluded there was nowhere near enough time for that to have occurred. In fact, when the Apostle Paul mentions that Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time, he specifically states that many of them are still alive. In effect, he was saying, hey, these people are still around. Go check them out. Ask them yourselves if you don't believe me. They'll tell you what they saw. <coughs> That's how confident he was. There were witnesses still around for people to question because their proclamation that Jesus was the risen Son of God began virtually immediately after his death. The second E stands for the word empty, the empty tomb of Jesus. During his trial, Jesus' chief accuser was the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, who served in that position from 18 to 37 AD. It was Caiaphas who accused Jesus of blasphemy for claiming to be God and handed over to Pilate to be killed. Just six years ago, archaeologists were digging in Jerusalem and they managed to uncover the burial plot of Caiaphas and his family. But though his accuser's grave has been found, nobody to this day has ever uncovered the body of Jesus himself. Jesus' body was laid to rest in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, 
a prominent member of the Jewish council, and the tomb was sealed and placed under heavy guard, and yet it was discovered empty on Easter morning by this, and this is significant, women. You see the fact that the ancient documents say women discovered the tomb really lends it even more credibility. The reason is that women had low status in Jewish society at the time and didn't even legally qualify as witnesses. So if the disciples were making up this story, surely they would have claimed that some men of a repute had discovered the empty tomb because their testimony would have been more credible in that culture. This is just one more indication the writers were committed to accurately recording what actually happened. But there's more. There's, here's the most powerful fact concerning Jesus' tomb. Nobody ever claimed it was anything but empty. Even his opponents admitted it was vacant on Easter. They tried to bribe the cards to say the disciples stole his body while they were asleep, which is ridiculous because they didn't have the motive or the opportunity. And besides, how would the guards have known it was the disciples if they were sleeping? More importantly, if the guards had been caught sleeping, they would have been executed because that was the penalty for sleeping on duty from the Roman army. But the point is, when the disciples declared the tomb was empty, Jesus' opponents didn't respond by saying, Oh, no, it's not. Or you've got the wrong tomb. Ha! Huh, here's the body right here. Instead, they admitted it was true. The tomb was vacant. Now the question is, how did it get empty? For instance, the Romans wouldn't have taken the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders wouldn't have taken the body. They wanted him to stay dead. Either the Jews or the Romans would have loved to have paraded Jesus' lifeless body down Main Street of Jerusalem because this would have instantly killed the growing Christian movement that they would have expended so much energy trying to destroy. But they couldn't because they didn't have a body. And the disciples had nothing to gain and everything to lose by stealing the body. Why would they want to live a life of deprivation and suffering and be tortured to death for a lie? If this had been a charade, if certainly one of them would have broken ranks under the torture and told the truth. And then I thought, well, maybe the women went to the wrong tomb. After all, they happened in the pre-dawn darkness. Maybe they lost their way. But that doesn't withstand scrutiny either. Not only did Mary and the other women find the tomb empty, but Peter and John came and checked it out too. What are the odds that all made the wrong, same mistake and all went to the wrong tomb? And don't you think they would have made absolutely sure it was the right tomb before they risked their lives for claiming Jesus' body was gone? Besides, their friend Joseph of Arimathea knew where his own grave was. And if somehow they all came down with amnesia, you don't think the Jewish and Roman authorities would have gladly pointed out the real tomb to show Jesus was still in it? The unanimous testimony of history is that the tomb was empty on Easter Sunday. There was no motive for the disciples or the Romans or the Jewish authorities to have stolen the body. The only explanation that fits then is that Jesus really did return from the dead. Our 30 is eyewitnesses. Not only was Jesus' tomb empty, but over a period of 40 days, Jesus appeared alive a dozen different times to more than 515 individuals. To men and women, to believers and doubters, to tough-minded people and tender-hearted people, sometimes to groups, sometimes to individuals, sometimes indoors, sometimes outdoors, in broad daylight. He talked with people. He ate with them. He even invited one skeptic to put his finger in his nail holes of his hands and to put his hand in the spear wound in his side in order to verify that it was him. And that disciple, who we call Doubting Thomas, became so convinced that he ended up proclaiming to his violent death in South India, where he was speared to death for his faith, that Jesus had indeed been resurrected. 515 people. That is a huge number of witnesses. Stop and put that in context. Think about it this way. If I were to hold a trial and we were to call witnesses to the stand, every witness that personally encountered the resurrection Jesus, and we cross-examined each one of them for only 15 minutes, and if we were to went around the clock without a break, how long do you think we'd be sitting here? The first-hand eyewitness testimony would continue through tonight, through all, all of Sunday and Sunday night, through all of Monday and Monday night, through all day Tuesday and Tuesday night, through all day Wednesday and Wednesday night, through all day Thursday, and we'd be listening to the last eyewitness account at about 3 o'clock 
on Friday afternoon. After listening to more than 128 hours, who could possibly walk away unconvinced? So then you can ask yourself, well, maybe the appearances were all hallucinations. It was a mass hallucination. But psychologists said there's not possible because hallucinations are like dreams. They're individual events that can't be shared between people. It would be like me asking you, well, do you, did you enjoy the dream I had last night? In fact, one expert said that 500 people sharing the same hallucination would be a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. So we could also say, well, maybe it wasn't hallucinations, but maybe an example of what psychologists call groupthink, a kind of wishful thinking where people in a group subtly encourage one another through the power of suggestion to see an image. Well, Dr. Derry Collins, the president of the National Association of Psychologists, a pro university professor of psychology for 20 years and the author of more than 40 books on groupthink, says, no, that's not possible, because the circumstances were all wrong for anything like this to have occurred. For instance, the disciples weren't expecting Jesus to be resurrected. They were totally contrary to their Jewish beliefs, and so they weren't primed for this sort of thing to happen. Besides, Jesus ate with them, he talked to them, and he appeared numerous times for all kind of people in various settings, all of which runs contrary to the group think theory. Besides, what about the empty tomb? If they just imagined Jesus, then where was his body? Certainly the Romans would have produced it if they had it. Friends, the appearances of Jesus were not a hallucination, they were not wish fulfillment, and they weren't mythology or mistake. They were real events of history that revolutionized the lives of those it impacted. I mean, look at what happened to the disciples. Before Easter, they were dejected. Peter had denied him three times. They were longing around, scared and terrified. In fact, when they came to tell him that Jesus was alive, they were locked in a room together. Sure, it was the, the Roman guards coming to arrest them for being Jesus' followers. And yet, after his resurrection, after his resurrection, these once cowardly, weak followers turned into people filled with courage willing to fearlessly proclaim to their death that Jesus had conquered the grave. Well, maybe you really aren't persuaded by the fact that they would die; they would be willing to die for their beliefs. After all, we have lots of people who die for their faith throughout history. Look at the terrorists, the Muslim terrorists, who blow themselves up and kill a lot of other people. Why was he willing to die that way? Because he sincerely believed he would immediately go to be with his God in paradise. Then someone pointed out to me that what the disciples did was extremely different from that. So think about it this way. People will die for their religious beliefs if they're convinced their beliefs are true, like that terrorist. But people don't die for their religious beliefs if they know the beliefs are false. And the disciples were in the unique position of history to know firsthand, to know for sure whether Jesus had really risen from the dead. They'd encountered him, they talked and ate with him, and they declared it was true. He was resurrected. It wasn't an hallucination or a trick. And because it was true, they were willing to die for it. Don't you see? If they had been lying, do you think they really would have let themselves be crucified like Peter was, or beheaded, or beaten, or dragged by hell or horses and quartered, or stabbed by a spear by proclaiming the gospel? They were tortured to death for, for a lie? No, nobody will knowingly and willingly die if they know it's a lie. Luck who was right. The evidence is absolutely overwhelming. The three E's add up to a powerful and persuasive equation. Early counts plus an empty tomb plus eyewitness testimony equal certainty that Jesus was indeed resurrected. And that's the ultimate authentication that he was who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. But there is more to this than just a historical curiosity. The resurrection has profound implications for you and me, folks. And to that, I want to explain it by using a story that I heard from Alfred Hitchcock. Yes, Alfred Hitchcock. And it's recounted in a book by David Jeremiah. It's not a true story, so please don't run around and say Pastor Mike is making up stories, because I didn't make this up. Alfred Hitchcock did. But it, it, it illustrates my point perfectly. 
A woman murdered her husband years ago and was sentenced to life in prison. She vowed that somehow, some way, she'd escape. As her prison bus approached the penitentiary, she saw an old man, another prisoner, covering up a grave in the small cemetery outside the prison walls. Right then and there, she had an idea, and she hatched a plot. Once inside, she befriended this old man, this prisoner. He was going blind and needed cataract surgery, and she told him, I'll give you the money for your surgery if you'll help me escape. She said, and he agreed, so here was the plan. The next time she heard the bell toll, which indicated an inmate had died, she would sneak down to the workroom where the old man made the caskets and slide inside with the body and pull the covering clothes. He would wheel the, castle out, ca the casket out to the cemetery, lower it in the grave, and cover it with dirt. That night, when nobody was watching, he'd return and dig up the casket and set her free. Late one night, the bell tolled. The woman sneaked down to the workroom. It was dark, but she found the casket, lifted the lid, and slipped inside next to the body, pulled the cover over her, and waited. Sure enough, a few hours later, she felt the casket being rolled down the grave, down toward the gravesite. She smiled as the casket was lowered into the hole. She heard the clumps of dirt hitting the gas casket and covering her up. She had done it. She could barely contain her excitement. Silence followed as she waited in the dark. Time began to drag. Hours passed, and then more. Finally, she began to worry. She broke out in a cold sweat. Where was that old man? What was keeping him? Can you imagine the emotions that would have coursed through her? In a moment of panic, she finally reached into her pocket and found a match and struck it. As she lit it, she glanced at the corpse laying next to her and saw that it was the old man himself. Her only hope lay buried right next to her. So here's the lesson for you and me, folks. The woman had placed her hope in another human being who she sincerely thought would be able to save her. But he went to his grave and ended up taking her with him. Every single religious leader in history is in his grave right now. Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, all of them except one, and that's Jesus Christ. His tomb is, tomb is empty because he had the power of God overcome the grave. So let me ask this question. Who are you going to put your hope in to help you overcome the grave? You just heard the evidence. It points compellingly toward Jesus Christ as telling the truth when he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. One thing we haven't really talked about yet is the why of Jesus' death. You see, your wrongdoing separated you from a perfect God. And out of his love for you, Jesus chose to suffer the pain of the cross as your substitute. To pay the penalty that you deserve for your sin so that you can be reconciled with God. And when you confess your wrongdoing and personally apply Christ's work to the cross on, into your life, you receive Christ as your forgiver and leader, and you receive eternal life as a gift of grace. Then you can have confidence that you, too, will overcome the grave and spend eternity with him in heaven. You decide, but keep the image of that hopeless woman in mind when you ask yourself this question. Who is the only one who the evidence has demonstrated can offer you hope for your eternity? Easter says you can put truth in the grave, but he did not stay there. Today, I ask you, do you know him? The evidence is so compelling to recognize that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. He is alive. He is our only hope. He is our only hope and our only means of salvation. Join me as we close in prayer. Father, first off, I pray 
that you would help us to see the evidence for what it truly is. That it is compelling to understand that your son is alive. That he is no longer dead, but he is risen just as he said. So amazes me that the disciples didn't understand that, even though he tried to tell them. In fact, the only ones who even understood that were the Jewish leaders who were trying to make sure he stayed in that grave. That's why they had the Roman soldiers sent out there because of what Jesus had said. But his own disciples didn't get it. They missed it. They didn't believe he would rise again. We stand before a risen Savior to know that you died for us, Lord. You died for us. You didn't have to do what you did. We know that you could have called down legions of angels to defend you. We know that you never had to be born. You never had to come to this planet. But you loved us so much you willingly took on human form and died in a horrible death so that you might bring us life. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hands of mercy, and I know, Lord, that you live and because you live, we can face all things. We can face tomorrow knowing that you are there and that you love us and that you care for us. Father, I pray for those who hear my voice tonight and they don't know you. They've denied your existence or they deny that you are Lord. Father, I pray that you would open their minds and their hearts to help them see how determining this evidence truly is, how compelling it is to know that you definitely rose, that your son rose again. Bring them that if you really are who you say you are, that you really did rise from the dead, then you are the son of God and you are the only hope for a world that desperately needs you. We seek your face, O oh God. We seek your name. Help us to, res to enjoy and understand what you sacrificed for us and to live our lives in, con in understanding and reality of the resurrection that everything we do and say and think is constantly reminding us that you are alive, that you are not in that grave, that we serve a risen Lord. Thank you for hearing our cry, O oh God. In your most precious Son's name, Amen. If you've been listening to me tonight and you've heard my voice, and whether it's on live stream or in world, and you have recognized that you need a savior and that Jesus died for you specifically, then I invite you to share that with us. You can instant message myself or Brian, or if you're not able to get into Second Life, you can also leave us an email message on our website, which I'll get Brian or Renee to actually post. Maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing it with us, but you've, you've got some questions about Jesus. And you're not really willing to come to one of us and say, hey, I need to understand more. Um, you can go to thegoodnews.org 
which is 1-888-JESUS-20 on the phone. And they can help you understand and give you some more answers, help you plug into a church where you live. I invite you to join us again tomorrow for our morning service. Um, I invite you to join us. We meet every when, every night, Monday through Friday, Monday through Sunday, um, at 5 p.m. We have a fellowship on Monday and Tuesday night. Um, right now, we're and I preach again on Wednesday night, and then on Thursday night, we're having we'll have our last Bible study um, on the series we're working on, which is the final week of Jesus Christ, and we're actually going to talk about the resurrection again, which is a pretty exciting subject. We'll do that on Thursday night at 5 p.m. And then Brian has a Bible study on Friday night at 5 p.m. And then, of course, Saturday we'll have our our regular Saturday evening service at 5. Um, may God bless and keep you. We'll be up in the foyer if you need to talk, if you want to share something with us. Um, if you're online and you need to ask us a question, you can instant message us even if we're not here. And we will... We get it. It comes to my email. It comes to Brian's email. Um, you can also instant message Renee um, or Negley, if you, especially if you're a Spanish speaker, because um, Renee Negley is our our um, who speaks Portuguese and I guess Spanish. I'm not sure. And um, he's not here tonight, which because it's Easter Sunday for him um, is um, Bill Cockrell, who's one of our elders. And uh, if uh, you want to instant message him, you're more than welcome to contact him as well. He'd be more than happy to talk with you and to help you if he can. Um, he speaks New Zealand. Yeah, I'm not sure what language. Yeah, well, Bill just popped in, so he's he's coming in late, but he's here. Um, like I said, we'll be in the foyer. I'm going to go ahead and shut down voice now. Um, We'll be up in the foyer if you need to talk or if you want to, you know, come and ask some questions or you've got some ideas or you, you want more information about the church or our ministry. We'd be more than glad to talk to you. May God bless and keep you. Thank you for being here tonight. Easter. What is Easter? What significance does it carry? What impact does it have on us? Easter conjures thoughts of spring. Flowers blooming, grass growing, trees budding, new life beginning. But before spring, we must endure winter's pallor. Barren trees, bleak skies, frozen, lifeless earth. Easter connotes joy. The risen Savior, the empty tomb, hope for everlasting life. But before the resurrection, we must acknowledge the cross. Excruciating death, deep sorrow, the hopelessness of the grave, the fear and scattering of the faithful. Easter confirms victory. Death loses its power. The grave loses its sting. But to experience victory, a battle must be fought. A war waged, the lines were drawn, and powers collided in an epic struggle with eternal consequences. These images mirror our existence. Before faith in Christ, our hearts lay dormant, our future grim, our souls defeated, life, joy, and victory were beyond our grasp until Jesus changed everything. His death and resurrection literally shook the foundations of the earth. The conflict raged between incomparable good and consummate evil. Jesus stormed into the fray because we were unable to withstand the assault on our own. He offered himself so that we might be rescued from the penalty of sin. Our struggle became his. His victory became ours. Violence, darkness, and destruction gave way to peace, brilliance, and restoration as the power of God exploded throughout creation. In a moment of time, the fate of humanity was forever altered. Jesus conquered Satan and secured our immortal destiny. Thus, Easter extends blessings to us 
grace, forgiveness, mercy, hope, life, eternity. But Easter also requires a decision to receive or reject those blessings. We can fall prey to disbelief and remain victims of sin's allure, or we can accept the sacrifice and salvation Jesus offers. Let us choose wisely. What is Easter? What significance does it carry? What impact does it have on us? New life, joy, and victory now are ours for the taking just because of Jesus, because of Easter.